Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the beginning of the semester, because that's what it feels like outside. But that's okay, it's gonna melt. Good morning, Joey. Joey, I, I really like the question that you asked in office hours. I don't know why it wasn't obvious. But the idea of why we can't just do Gauss elimination, that was very, very interesting. Good morning, JC. Good morning, JR. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to April, the month of four seasons. For those of you not in Buffalo, we have a couple inches of snow outside. So, morning, Tidy. There were lots of questions on the project yesterday. I felt like I was responding on Discord all day. Um, I don't know. Like I said, the sn I mean, the snow's gonna melt. It'll melt. It's just annoying that we have to deal with it. <laughs> oh. uh, remove the cube. <sighs> Yes, yes, Joe. It really, it usually does snow somewhat, but like, like there's inches. It's not just flurries. Like there's inches on the ground, um, which is at least is different. <laughs> we don't put snow tires on our cars for some odd obscure reason. I feel like we should storage maybe, but yes, it's always inevitable. Um, what what do you mean, tidy? What do you mean the snow is not helping with the stress behind exams? Does the snow make you stressed out? It'll melt. It'll melt. It'll go away. By the end of tomorrow. And then it'll be sunny. Got it. That makes sense, JR. Um, Matt, you're half of B and some of C done now. That's awesome. That's great. Um, and I hope, hopefully you guys are... are like, the project is meant to be a lot of work, but hopefully it's been more manageable. Like I said on Monday, I've been really impressed with, um, with everybody. Like, usually it's, they send me code and it's got most of the pieces done. It's just little tweaks here and there. Um, also, if you get work, if you get, uh, if you get stuck on B and C, and you just you can't go to office hours or you're just not progressing forward, move on to D and E. You do not need to finish B and C in order to do D and E. So don't lose out on those points. Oh my goodness. This weather, it's... It'll melt. I keep telling myself it'll melt tomorrow. It'll melt tomorrow. I told my husband last night. I was like, remind me not to shovel the driveway. Because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Just a little bit. And like, like, I, uh, yeah, I have to not think about shoveling. Um, let's see, Windows, uh, JC, don't, so like, at least my husband's family, and I know a couple of their families, they would always put cling wrap on their, vid on their windows, um, in winter. To seal it in. Um, you should do that in the future. You're like, I don't know, there's special like window sealing. It's, it's like big saran wrap. Um, you just put it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, Matt, I have no idea how to format the A matrix for C. Um, watch the video. <laughs> Watch the video, go read Discord. Lots of people have worked on that problem as well. Um, nice, Aurora. I like it. I am not in sweatpants. I wear jeans. Mostly because I tell myself I'm working. And I need to at least wear jeans. 
<laughs> my husband, though, my husband's been working up from home for longer than the pandemic. He's been working home since we moved to Buffalo. And he's constantly in sweatpants. All the time. Constantly in sweatpants. Um, but I like the Christmas touch. The Christmas touch. Very, very awesome. Okay. It is time for class to start. Uh, it's 9.10. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So today, we are continuing with the idea of uh, LU factorization, but we're gonna add a little spin to it and actually, I'm gonna show you why. So let's say we have a system of equations. Nope, wrong one. That looks like this. Let's say we have an A matrix that looks like this. And we start to do LU factorization, which in order to do LU factorization, remember it's those same three row operations every time. We are going to take row uh, two, row two, and replace row two by adding it to the multiple of row one. And then we're gonna take row three and replace it by adding it to some multiple of row one. And then we're gonna take row three again and replace it by adding it to some multiple of row two. So those are my three row operations whenever I'm doing LU factorization, one, two, three. So for this matrix, for this matrix, it's going to be um, R2 equals R2 plus, or yeah, plus, uh, negative six over three or negative two. So that's my first multiplier, which means that L two one is negative two. Just all of our fun notation where this number is going to go in our L matrix. And then same idea for this row operation R three equals R three plus, um, four thirds R one R yeah. So L2, 3, nope, L3, 1. I did all of this work this morning and didn't have any issues with my notation. Uh, is 4 thirds. So I'm just writing these L's here because I know those are going to go in my L matrix. So once I do these first two row operations, I end up with, I'm going to erase this. Once I do these first two row operations, I'm going to end up with row 1 doesn't change. Row two becomes, I'll just write it down, zero, zero, five, and then zero, row three becomes zero, 32 thirds, and seven thirds. And my third row operation is row three equals row three plus, now I need to figure out how to make this a zero. And typically I do that by taking, if you remember from Monday, we take this number divided by this number. So 32 thirds over zero. But notice we're dividing by zero here. We can't do this. Math breaks. We can't have something divided by zero. So this is a limitation of LU factorization. If we ever end up with a zero in our pivot location, in our elimination row, in our pivot location, row that we use to do the elimination, um, LU factorization breaks down. We cannot move forward. We're stuck here. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna introduce something called PLU factorization. So this is LU factorization. PLU factorization, not a P. essentially is how we're going to overcome this limitation. So PLU factorization means we're going to start to do permutations, P uh, permutations, we're just going to start to do row swaps. So P is going to be our row swapping matrix. L is going to be our matrix of our elimination multipliers. And then U is going to be our resulting matrix in a lower, and with our lower triangle of zeros. So we're gonna do five row operations for PLU factorization instead of three operations, but it's the same five every single time. So it's the same idea as LU factorization, but now we're gonna add in two extra row operations in order to do row swaps. So our five row operations are going to be um, a row swap. Then we're gonna do row two equals row two plus a multiple of row one. 
and then row three equals row three of some multiple row one. Then we're gonna do some row swaps again. And then we're gonna do our last row operation. R3 equals R3 plus some multiple row two. So for LU factorization, it's just these three row operations. We're done, we can move forward. Get U, construct L. For PLU factorization, we're gonna add in these two extra ones for row swapping. And the goal of these row swapping operations is to make sure that we get the largest number in magnitude to appear in the pivot location. So this row, this first row swap, we want to get the largest number in the one, one pivot location. For the second row swap, we want to get the largest number in the two, two pivot location. If we were continuing on with a four by four, we would just have more row operations in between here. And then we would continue with a row swap to get the largest number in the three, three pivot location and etc. But we're not gonna do that for a four by four, I think. I can't remember in your homework, I think it's just a three by three. And on the exam, it'll be a three by three. Or it would be a three by three. Exam's almost written. <laughs> like I said, I'll have more information next week. Okay, so let's go ahead and demonstrate this process, sorry, demonstrate this process on this matrix. Okay. I'm going to delete this so I can do these row operations alongside. Okay, so my first row operation. My first row operation is a row swap. The goal is to get the largest number in the one one pivot location. So I'm gonna get the largest number in this location. When I say get the largest number, it means we are looking at all of the numbers in column one. So out of these numbers, the six is the largest, so that means I want to do a row swap between row one and row two. Once I do that, I end up with this. And I don't want necessarily need to order them. Like it's not three, then four, then six, or six, then four, then three. I just want to swap so that the largest number is first. And when I say largest number, we're really talking about magnitude. Like it doesn't matter if this was a negative four or a positive four, if this was a negative six or a positive six, it's just the largest number in magnitude. Okay, so I've done my first row swap. Woohoo! Now I do my row operations, or my uh, elimination steps. So number two and three. So two, I'm gonna place row two by adding row two to some multiple of row one. So now it's going to be row two minus or plus negative one half row one. So that L21 now is negative one half. And then row three is gonna be replaced by saying uh, two thirds row one. L31 is going to be two thirds. Okay, after I do those row operations, Three minus three is zero. Five minus five is zero. Negative two minus one half. Or minus negative one half, or yeah. Negative two minus one half is negative five uh, halves. Keep track of your signs. For my second one, uh, I'm gonna end up with zero. Negative four plus four. And then four plus 20 thirds or 32 thirds and then five plus two thirds or 17 thirds. So I've done those two row operations. Now my a row swap again. So now I want to do another row swap. The goal of this row swap, the second row swap, is to get the largest number once again in magnitude in the two two pivot location. The one caveat is for this one, I'm going to ignore row one. Row one is done, ignore it. I'm only looking at the numbers in column two below row two. So between these two numbers, I need to figure out which one's larger in magnitude. You may have guessed, it's gonna be 32 thirds. So I'm gonna swap these two. So I'm gonna swap row two with row three. Row 
when I do that, 6, 10, 1, 0, 32 thirds, 17 thirds, 0, 0, negative 5 halves. Woohoo! Did that. Now my last row operation. Row 3 is going to be row 3 plus some multiple of row 2. In this instance, it's going to be 0. Now you still need, even if there's a 0, still write it down because you need to keep track of your multipliers in order to construct L. So this instance, L32 is zero. So here are my five, wrong way, five row operations. The goal of your row swaps is to make sure the largest number appears in our pivot location. Um, no, so JR, there's not always gonna be a zero for four. I'm just, I'm just showing that as an example of where LU breaks down and where PLU um, is essentially required. Um, so you, if you're told you can just use LU factorization, sure, use LU factorization. Um, if you're not, if you're told to use PLU, or it also might be written as PA equals LU. There's a bunch of caveats to this um, this method in terms of the matrices we end up with. Um, then you'll have to use PA equals LU. I mean, the only difference is you have those row swaps. Um, yeah. So, no, JC, um, so you don't have to use, okay, so if you end up with a zero in a pivot location, you need to use PLU factorization. Um, Joey, okay, let me keep going with Jesse. Um, so you may end up with a multiplier that is a zero even with LU factorization. So if you ever have a matrix that looks something like this, here, our first row operation would be row two equals row two plus zero row one. So this is an instance where L21 would equal zero. We have a multiplier of zero, but we can still use LU factorization. So it's not, it's not if there's a multiplier that ends up being zero. It's just one of those, this is a method where you can use in any instance. It just uses, it's just applicable more often than LU factorization. And it accounts for those instances where we end up with a zero in the pivot location. Not a multiplier that's a zero. These are your multipliers. It's where we end up with a zero in the pivot location. But like I said, you'll be told, um, you'll be told what to do. Um, so Joey, um, does PLU ever not work? Um, yes, PLU will not work if your determinant is equal to zero. <laughs> um, so PLU won't work if uh, we end up with a situation like this. Let's say that ended up being zero as well. Um, but in this situation, you don't have a solution. Your determinant will be equal to zero. You'll end up with a row of zeros. That's not what it was. Um, so PLU won't work if you would ever end up with a row of zeros or if your determinant is not equal to zero or if there's no solution or an infinite number of solutions to your um, system of equations. Um, but it, it should work as long as there is a solution. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that next week. Um, you'll see it in your videos. There's a lot of videos this week for you guys to watch on Friday, a lot being like 30 minutes instead of 20 minutes. Um, and part of that's just because there's a lot more theoretical concepts that we're gonna talk about next week, but that's where this comes into play, where thinking about, okay, when will we be able to use um, different methods? When will certain methods work? When will certain methods not work? And all that fun stuff. Okay, so. Okay, so we've done our row operations, that's great. Now we need to put together our matrices. We need a P matrix, we need an L matrix, and we need a U matrix now. We end up with, or whatever we end up with is still our U matrix. So just like with LU factorization, whatever you end up with at the end of your row operations is going to be your U matrix. Your P matrix, your P matrix and your L matrix are given, going to be constructed given your row operations. And it's a little bit, less straightforward than with LU factorization. So let's talk about our P matrix first. Our P matrix starts out with identity. 
And then what we do is we literally just apply the row operation or the, the row swapping operations. So if I swapped row one and row two in my first row operation, I'm gonna swap row one and row two in P. And then if I swapped row two and three in my second um, row swapping, I'm gonna swap them again or swap them in P. So once you've done your row operations, once you've done your row swappings, whatever you end up with here is P. So P starts out with identity. You apply the first row swapping operation, and then you apply the second row swap operation. Whatever you end up with is P. Okay. L. L is a little bit more complicated. L is still gonna be constructed from our multipliers, but L also needs to incorporate P. So L starts out with identity. And then we're gonna start with our last row operation and work our way up through all of them, putting in our numbers one at a time. So first I'm gonna enter in L32. So here's L32 in that location. It's a zero, so you can't really see it, but I'm just gonna leave it there. Okay, so I've done that one. And then I'm gonna move on to this one. Sorry, this one. I'm going to do this same operation. So I'm gonna swap rows two and three. So now L is gonna look like this. And then I'm gonna do this one and do this one. So I'm gonna put in L32 and L21 in the same locations that they would be normally. So this is L31, this is L21. So that means this becomes a negative two thirds because remember I need to change the sign. And this one becomes a positive one half. So put them in their normal locations that you would have if you hadn't done any row swaps. So this is L21, this is L31. And then you apply this last row swap. Swap row one and row two. And there you go, there's L. So L is a little bit more difficult to construct um, using PLU factorization because when we construct L, we need to take into account the fact that we did those row swaps. So U is just that matrix we ended up with at the end of all of our row operations. P is, starts out with identity, and then you just apply the row swaps to identity. And then L, it doesn't matter the order in which you apply the row, row swaps. Um, yeah, it really doesn't. Um, uh, let me, let me confirm that you, if you swapped that one first, okay. It does matter. You do P in the, the first one, you do it in order this one. And then this one, and then L is constructed, but we need to work our way back through the row operations. And there's mathematical reasons for this. It's because of the way that, um, PLU factorization and LU factorization are derived. Um, and if you want to know that, I can go through that separately. <laughs> um, but once again, it has to do with the fact that you have your um, elementary matrices um, and the way you multiply your, ma your A matrix by your elementary matrices and then reconstruct everything so that A equals your result. It's, it's like I said, the mathematics isn't that, isn't that difficult, um, but I'm trying to be a little bit more applicable here and just show you how you can do it. Okay. So L, we start with our last row operation and just work our way up through all of them until we've done our row stop. Notice though, if you notice, L doesn't end up being a strict triangle matrix. Um, so Luke, you always change the sign on all of your multipliers. 
So technically, if this was a positive zero, we would have written a negative zero. So we'll make L3 a negative zero in our final answer if you want. Um, but yes, you always change the sign on your multipliers um, when you put them in L. Um, okay, so notice L is not a strict triangle matrix. So sometimes you'll see L written as a strict triangle matrix where these rows are rearranged in order to create our triangle of zeros. So we would rearrange it, L, uh, one, zero, zero, one, half, zero, nope, wrong one, negative two thirds, one, zero, and one, half, zero, one. And the way we can get this L is if we just multiply it by P. So sometimes, sometimes you'll see L in a strict triangle matrix form, but keep in mind that that's including P and L. And that comes into play if we ever use PLU factorization in order to solve a system of equations. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's solve a system of equations using PLU factorization. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's say we have a system that looks like this. We could use LU factorization. We could. We would just say, so let's do LU factorization over here and PLU over here. So for LU factorization, we would first say our two equals row two uh, plus five halves row one, and then row three equals row three plus or minus, uh, plus one R one. And we would end up with this. Note, when we do LU factorization, we're just talking about A. So we would end up with two, negative five, two, zero, uh, negative 33 halves 3, and then 0, negative 1, 7. And then our third row operation, R3 equals R3, plus in this instance, it would be 2, two 33, negative R2, negative 22 thirds, thir 22 30 thirds. And we would end up with our matrix like this. Remember, we typically end up with fractions when we're talking about LU factorization. We end up with even more fractions with PLU factorization, and we'll talk about that, why that is in a minute. So this ends up being my U. My L21 was 5 halves, my L31 was 1, and then my L32 was uh, negative, 20, negative 2 30 thirds. So when I construct L, it ends up looking like this. I put in L21, so negative 5 halves, change the sign. Put in L31, change the sign. Put in L32, change the sign. That's what it would look like using LU factorization. And then we could nicely set up our system of equations where we have LUX equals B. So I just replace A by saying LU, that's my goal. So I end up with LUX equals B. I break it up into two pieces, LY equals B and UX equals Y. So I just take out UX, replace it with Y. So I solve two systems. So LY equals B would look like this. And then B was 15, negative 15, zero. Which means Y1 is 15. If I plug that into my second equation, Y2 ends up being 45 halves. If I plug both of those into my third equation, I get Y3 equals 150 over 11. Once I have those numbers, I can plug it in to u y or u x equals y, so u looks like this. Two, two. 
my y values, y1 was 15, y2 was 45 halves, y3 was 150 over 11. And I can solve for x. You can see here, x3, notice I have 11 that shows up on both sides, which is great. That means I'm probably gonna end up with mostly whole numbers or at least small fractions. And most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time we give you problems that end up with whole numbers, which is nice, convenient. Um, sometimes you might see small fractions, but most of the time you should end up with a whole numbers. So this ends up being um, x3 is two. If I plug that into this equation, I find that x2 is equal to negative one. And if I plug it into this equation, I get x1 is equal to, come on, uh, to three. And there we go, I have solved my system of equations using LU factorization. I broke up A into L times U using my three row operations. And I rewrite my system as LUX equals B. And then I have two sets to solve. But it's, it's fine, it's fine solving those two sets. It's a nice, easy system both times because I have my triangle of zeros. The same process applies for PLU factorization. So let's do PLU over here. Same A matrix. I'm just breaking it up into PLU. Okay, so my first row operation, I am going to get the largest number in the one one location. So looking at this first column, the largest magnitude, remember, I don't care about the sign. So I'm looking at two, five and two, the largest of those is five. So my first row operation, I'm going to swap row one with row two. When I do that, I end up with this. Now I do my elimination steps. So I'm gonna say row two equals row two plus two fifths row one. Just take this number divided by this number. And then I'll say row three equals row three plus negative two fifths row one. This number divided by that number. The sign, so what I'll do typically is I will take uh, this number divided by this number and then I'll figure out which sign I need to be, what sign it needs to be in order to make those opposite. Um, I mean, there's, yeah. So here L21 ends up being two fifths and L31 ends up being negative two fifths. Once I do those row operations, I end up with this result, negative five, negative four, negative two, row one doesn't change. And I get my zero, negative 33 fifths and six fifths. And then row three becomes zero, 28 fifths and 29 fifths. So no, we didn't have to use PLU factorization for this one. It still works out with LU factorization. We did that on the other side. And if you notice, L21, L31, my multipliers are different and that's fine. Your multipliers end up being different. Typically, they are scalars of each other. Notice L21 here is 2.5 and L31 is one. So it turns out when we do LU factorization, we can have multipliers of any magnitude. It really just depends on the numbers in our matrix. When we do PLU factorization, our multipliers are always gonna end up being one or less. So notice this L21 ends up being 0 0.4. This one ends up being negative 0.4. So when we do PLU factorization, we're always gonna end up with our multipliers of a magnitude of one or less. And there are benefits to this. Um, some benefits include if you have really large differences in your numbers in your matrix, which we don't give you examples like that because you're beginners and um, 
and it just makes it easier. However, in the real world, as you're constructing your matrices, you're going to end up with different magnitudes of, uh, of values in your matrix, um, depending on the application. If you guys think about your project, your solution ends up being really small numbers. And they're in they're they're scaled dramatically. Like you've got some numbers that are negative uh, ten to the negative twenty six. You have some numbers that are only uh, ten to the negative five. That's a very big range when you think about literally the number of zeros you put past your decimal point. Um, so this is one of the benefits to LU factorization and PLU factorization, um, and it really just depends on what numbers you end up with in your matrix. Uh, but PLU factorization, we're always going to have multipliers with a value of one or less, which like I said, we just end up with more fractions. Okay, so I've done uh, my first three row operations. I have two more. Uh, my next row swaps, I'm looking at these numbers, figuring out which one is larger in magnitude, which in this instance is 33 fifths. So I'm gonna swap row two with row two. Really, I'm not doing anything. I don't need to do a row swap, but I'm still keeping track of that row operation. And my last row operation, I'm gonna place row three by saying row three is going to be 28 fifths over 33 fifths row two. When I do that, I end up with negative five, negative four, negative two. Row two doesn't change either and then row three ends up becoming zero zero and 75 elevenths notice i have similar numbers in my um, matrices between lu and plu you're dealing with the same numbers you're going to get common factors between the two but they are different one of them is usually just a scaled version of another. So here L32 ends up being 28 30 thirds. Okay, so this ends up being my U, just like before. That's my U. Now I need to put together P, where P starts out with an identity. I'm going to swap rows 1 and 2, and then I'm going to swap rows 2 and 2. So P ends up being just identity with rows 1 and 2 swapped. there was only one row swap that occurred and then L L I'm gonna construct by working my way up working my way back through my row operations so I start out with identity I insert L32 so L32 goes right here and I change the sign. So negative 28 30 thirds. And then I'm gonna swap rows two with row two. So row two swaps, which nothing really happens. And then I'm gonna insert these ones. So L2 one goes here and it becomes negative two fifths. And L3 one goes here and becomes positive two fifths. So five. And then lastly, I'm gonna swap rows one and two. So these two are gonna switch places. So this becomes a one and a zero. This becomes negative two fifths and one. There we go, there's L, P, L, and U. Okay, now comes the fun part. <laughs> Some of the caveats when it comes to PLU factorization. So like I said, when it comes to PLU factorization, a lot of times, you're gonna see P and L combined, which puts L as a strict lower triangle matrix. If you have this result, if you are using the strict lower triangle matrix form of L, where P and L are multiplied by each other, then you're gonna write your system of equations like this. P, nope, L, U, X equals P, B. So if you apply your row swaps to L, you also need to apply your row swaps to B. 
Um, yeah, yeah, I can do the, the matrix multiplication for PL. Okay, let's... Okay. Nice thing is I have lots of zeros, so things cancel out. Okay, so for this first row, first column, I'm gonna end up with zero times negative two fifths plus one times one plus zero times two fifths or a one. With my second column, it's going to be zero plus zero plus zero. Third column, zero plus zero plus zero. Column two, or row two, sorry, row two. In column one, I'm gonna end up with a negative two fifths plus zero plus zero, or negative two fifths. Column two, it's gonna be a one plus a zero plus a zero. In column three, zero, zero, zero. And then row three. Column one, I'm gonna end up with zero, zero, two fifths. Column two, I'm gonna end up with zero, uh, zero, negative 28 thirds. And then column three, zero, zero, one. So whenever you apply a P matrix, in this instance, it's called a permutation matrix. It's where identity with the rows swapped. What it's gonna do is when we do that multiplication, it's just gonna apply the same row swaps in my L matrix here. So if in PL, only rows one and two were switched, then, or if in, sorry, if in P, only rows one and two were switched, when I do this multiplication, it's just gonna do the same swap. It's gonna do the same operation, where rows one and rows two are switched in L. So notice this is L with rows one and row two switched. So that's what P will do. P will just rearrange L if, if, it's, if it's correctly constructed, if P and L are correctly constructed, when you multiply P times L, it's gonna do the same row operations, it's gonna do the same row swaps that were done to create P on L. And you should end up with your L with a strict triangle matrix where you have that upper triangle of zeros. So when you do LU factorization, a lot of times you'll see L with those permutations applied, with P multiplied by in order to get your strict lower triangle matrix. When you do that, our system of equations becomes LUX equals PB. Because secretly it's PL UX equals PB, or equals PB, yeah. So in order to account for the P appearing over here, we need to account, or we need to multiply B times P as well, which when you do that, it's just gonna rearrange B the same way. It's gonna rearrange B in the same order that P is rearranged. That is one way to do it. Then you would break it up such that your um, L, Y equals P, B now, and then U, X equals Y. which you would set it up the same way. So L would look like this. Y1, Y2, Y3. And then P times B. So B is originally, or I guess P looks like this. B was 15, negative 15, and zero. So if you do P times B, P is identity with rows one and two swapped. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna swap rows one and two here. So it would be negative 15 and 15 and zero. So if you do that, this tells you y1 equals negative 15. If you plug that into here, y2 ends up being nine. If you plug that in here, y3 ends up being 150 over 11. 
And then you have you, which ended up like this. Ux equals y. And you can solve for your unknowns. So x3 from this one ends up being 2. If you plug that into this one, x2 ends up being negative 1. And if you plug that into this one, x1 ends up being 3. Which is the same answers we got using LU factorization. So this is the method you would use if L is a strict lower triangle matrix where you've included P. And really, just do your matrix multiplication, just double check everything. If, if you don't want to do that extra step, if you just have U, P, and L and leave them alone where L is rearranged, it's not a strict lower triangle matrix. If you have this option, then you would just continue as you did over an LU factorization, where you would just say LUX equals B. You don't even need to do, deal with P anymore. You don't even need to deal with, P, deal with P anymore. And then you would say UX equals Y. Uh, you would say u x equals y. Come on. Come on, stylus. And l y equals b. So we've got negative 2 fifths, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2 fifths, negative 28, 30 thirds, and 1. y1, y2, y3 equals our b vector. This one tells me, well, I mean, and then, and then you would solve it as you'd need to. So you would start here. So this one tells you y2 equals negative 15. No, y1 equals negative 15. <laughs> there we go. If you plug that into here, you'd see y2 equals 9. And if you plug it in here, you'd see y3 equals 150 over 11. These are the same y values we got using this method. They're just out of order, which is fine. And then you still have ux equals y. So u still looks like this. X still looks like that. You plug in all your Y values. Keep in mind they're, in or they're not in order. So Y1 is negative 15, Y2 is nine, and then 150 over 11. And then you would just continue to solve. You'd find out that X3 is still two, X2 is still negative one, and X1 is still three. Okay. So it really just depends. For LU factorization, you still go through all your row operations. You still construct U, you still construct P, you still construct L. If you're using it to solve systems of equations, which is what our goal typically is, just keep in mind, you can use this if you keep L in its non-strict triangle matrix form. If you want L in a strict triangle matrix form, then you need to apply those same permutations, the same rearranging on your B vector. So those are your two options. Okay. Um, nope, too far.
So we ended up with the same solution regardless of which one we used. PLU, LU, doesn't matter. The same numbers appeared in multiple locations. However, in LU factorization, we're dealing with bigger numbers. So here I have 2.5. Here I have different fractions for Y, but I still get the same X values. In PLU factorization, you're gonna end up with smaller numbers just as an artifact of the way that you do your row swaps. But yeah, that's it. Um, okay. So just a summary. I will summarize it one more time down here so we can look at all of it. So LU factorization. Our first row operation is LR2 plus some multiple of row one. Then R3 equals row three plus a multiple of row one. And then R4, nope. And then R3 equals R3 plus a multiple of row two. Once we do that, we have LUX equals B. Break it up into LY equals B. And then UX equals Y. That is LU factorization. PLU. Same idea, but we have five row operations. First we do um, row swaps. Then we say R2 equals row two plus a multiple of row one. Then row three equals row three plus a multiple of row one. And then we do some more row swaps. And then we say row three equals row three plus a multiple of row two. Once we have that, we have a couple options. We end up with L, we end up with P, we end up with L, and we end up with U. If L is left alone, or if L is left alone and it's not a strict triangle matrix, not a triangle matrix, then we can just say L, U, X equals B. L, Y equals B, U, X equals Y. If L is really P, L, and it's a triangle matrix, then we have to say L, U, X equals P, B, where L, Y equals P, B, and then U, X equals Y. So we just have that extra piece. So pay attention to the way things are worded. You might be asked to find P, L, U such that L is a strict triangle matrix then you would need to apply this step here. And just pay attention to the wording. On the exam, it will be made clear about what method you would use. Okay, um, we're done. That's it. That's the summary for this week. Next week is our last set of material. Um, we're gonna go over some theoretical concepts, uh, which there's some pretty hefty theoretical concepts um, when it comes to span. So there's a longer video on span. But we'll talk about all that stuff next week. And then we will finish up next week, Wednesday, with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then we're done. The last week of classes, I'm going to do review. I'm going to take a system of equations. I'm going to solve it in all our different ways. Um, I think, maybe, I don't know. Um, but we'll have an idea about what the exam is. Um, and I will put all the review material together so that you're all set and prepped and it'll be great. Okay. Any final questions before we head out for today? Uh, I ha I've had a microphone the whole time. I've been putting earbuds in so that there's not, um, there's not like the speakers don't go into the microphone, but I've just given up on that. Um, <laughs> is there an update on Respondus? Um, no, uh, we meet tomorrow, the three instructors, and um, we meet tomorrow. Um, I will let you guys know next week, Monday, about it. Yes. But your job right now is to not worry about the exam. Your job right now is to do your homework, finish up your project, the best thing you can do for studying is to do your homework because your exam's gonna be 
linear algebra. It really is. You've, you've got MATLAB practice with your project. So the final exam is going to be focused on linear algebra concepts. Um, so it's really key that you do do your homework, do practice, um, because that that's how you're going to prep for your exam. Okay, I'm going to jump over to office hours. I'll see all y'all. So JC, that depends on whether or not we use Respondus. Um, you're not going to be asked to write MATLAB code. You might be asked, so you might be asked like, write down the code that you would write in MATLAB in order to solve the system of equations using a specific method. So uh, you might say, what's the function to get your matrix into reduced row echelon form, which is the RREF function, um, or um, what's like, like in your homework where it says, confirm your answers with MATLAB and write down the code that you used, something like that. But it's not gonna be like writing for loops um, writing if statements is just gonna be use MATLAB and its application application to linear algebra and all the functions that MATLAB already has. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, with that, I'll see all of you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>